morning, everyone. Apologies for the IT setup uh, delay. Uh, thanks for coming over. Um, I know you all of, all of you or most of you would have attended the main stage presentation. So what I'm going to cover today is two things. One, a lot of our customers and a lot of our partners talk to us about going on the cloud transformation journey. So what does that actually mean in terms of what are the key parameters? What does it mean in terms of business cases? And a few other things like uh, agility and so on and so forth. And second is what are some of the key insights and the trends that we are seeing in the market as Cloudera? So before I start, uh, who's from Cloudera over here? And who's heard me present this before? Brilliant, so I can repeat the stories. Because I've done this like four or five times now, so I had to check. And show of hands um, by industry so that I can make it more relevant. Uh, financial services? Uh, telco? Okay. Manufacturing? Retail, utilities, health sciences or, or anything like that? No one from health, brilliant. Um, any, any other industry that I missed? Sorry? Government. Government, public sector, perfect, yeah. So I'll try and give at least one example from each one of those so that it makes sense. So that's the uh, agenda for today. So as I said, we'll talk about the key things, what companies are doing, what are some of the challenges, why do you want to go on a journey like what we are prescribing, and the insights from the story. So these are some of the key considerations that we believe our customers are telling us that when they go onto the cloud, they have. But if you think of it, there are three which I would like to call out. Number one is agility. A lot of our customers are telling us that they want to go to the cloud because they want agility. They don't want to go to IT and then IT takes 12 months to procure a hardware or a server, whatever you might want to call it. And then it takes another six months to procure a software and then six months again to do, get into production. So primarily it is about the time to market. And the cost is an after effect. That's why if you look over there, the cloud economics, I'm calling it cloud economics, which does not necessarily mean cost. So what does that mean? So if you think of, if you're going on a cloud journey, there are three different types of cost buckets. One is obviously your infrastructure costs, whatever that might be. Second could be your FT reskilling costs, because a lot of FTEs would have had been trained on different subjects. And the third one is, what kind of use cases do you have? So I was speaking at the press analyst day yesterday, and one of the questions I got was, can Cloudera help us get to GDPR compliant? And I said, no company in the world can claim that. Because it's not about, uh, do you, are you compliant at a company level or an entity level? It's about the use case. As far as GDPR is concerned, if you do not have a PII data, there's no need. You don't have to be compliant in that respect. Similarly, in terms of cloud, it's not one story. You have to dissect at a business unit level, at a function level, and then at a use case level. So what a lot of people forget is when they're planning, they look at the overall TCO and they make judgments because more often times than not, the ask comes from the C-suite. But actually, you've got to have an understanding at a use case level, break it down, and look, does it make sense or not? So if I have a use case like cybersecurity, which I know I will run 24-7, 365 days a year, why do I need to go into the cloud? Similarly, if I have a use case where I have lighthouse workloads, and all I need to do is reporting from multiple different countries at the end of the month, perfect. That's a perfect example to go to cloud because you have ephemeral workloads. So you have to take that into consideration. Otherwise, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Then the third one is, the overall skill sets that you have, which is number seven over here. So DevOps and automation. So I've said this time and again, which is if you can't do DevOps and automation, it does not make sense to go into the cloud. If you can't do DevOps and automation on premise, then why would you have a skill set or a team or even a center of excellence who would allow you to go into the cloud in that respect? So those are some of the key things that we are observing. Data strategy is key. I'm not going to repeat it. We've been telling that. So. I was legacy Hortonworks, by the way, and um, as part of the cl overall cloud era story, we've told multiple times that your data strategy is key for your cloud strategy, which is key for your business strategy. It, and it involves everything, starting from data governance, metadata governance, portability, all of those elements around that respect. So 
I'm going to give you a few examples just to bring to light what I was talking about. <coughs> so the first one about DevOps and automation, right? If you see on the screen, it says an example about a telco, which is not a relatively large telco, so it's less than $10 billion in revenue in that respect. For them, they were able to upgrade a 200 node clusters in two days. But I went to a very large American telco, and they couldn't even get their production cluster up for 18 months. They had over 1,500 nodes in production, and we asked them, what's your most aggressive strategy which the CIO wants you to go ahead with? And they said 30% in three years. So they expect at max, within the next three years, 30% of their workloads will be on cloud. And that does not even mean public cloud or pass only. It includes a combination of IS and pass. So all of them are going on a hybrid strategy. But primarily, the reason was because the Polish telco, which I'm talking about, they had a lot of the skill sets in place. They had a lot of processes and governance mechanisms around that. And their DevOps teams were very successful around that. So that was one of the key levers. The second point is cloud portability. So one of the largest banks in Europe, uh, they're a very long time customer for us. They wanted to go into the cloud. And like everyone else, they said, we will go to one of the big three. When I say big three, it's Microsoft, Amazon, or Google. And they did uh, hundreds, uh, spend hundreds of millions of dollars on that respect. So when we started engaging with them, which was January 2018, at that time, they told us that we don't necessarily need to engage with you as Hortonworks. And we said, OK, that's fine. And then six months down the line, they started having issues around governance and security. And then we came back into the picture, and, and then we asked them, what is the fundamental problem that you have? What is the pain point that you can't solve? And the response was, number one, all applications are not cloud ready. And we didn't realize that at, at the start. And therefore, they started to engage with us in developing a hybrid strategy. But the key point was, they had six lines of businesses. Each lines of business had between three and 12 applications running on-premise. And to port every application from on-premise to the cloud, they would, it would cost them at least $2 million per app. So you can do the maths between three and 12 multiplied by six. And also, there's a loss of business continuity. Because if I have an app like Spend Analytics, so if I'm using my mortgage application on my mobile phone as my app, I need to have business continuity. I can't just port them overnight in that respect. So there's the cost of portability. There's the cost of bringing in every uh, vendor and the entire integrated suite of applications together. But there's also the cost of business continuity. And they told us it'll take them at least 18 to 24 months to get approval from compliance and everyone else to get the whole thing going. So there are multiple different types of costs which people don't consider. And portability is a key element around that. The third one is the cost model and the, va the value that you will generate. So what I mean by that is there are multiple procurement strategies which people will employ. So the way I see it is IT, the role of IT is changing. Before, IT would be front and center for a lot of the digital transformation programs. Today, now we see it is that they are becoming a provider of providers. What I mean by that is that all lines of businesses, risk, compliance, supply chain, marketing, et cetera, they can go to the cloud. I can go to, if I'm a lines of business, I can go to Microsoft and they will spin up a cluster and I can get my use case on them. But is that a production use case or is that a POC? <clears throat> That's one. And second is, if every lines of business started to go on their own route, who's going to govern the whole thing? So therefore, I believe that IT are becoming the provider of providers, and their fundamental value add is governance. And as a result of that, a lot of the procurement strategies are changing. So if you look at most of the large organizations, before, they would just have a cost to achieve. 20%, 30%, whatever, the, they would commit to the street, and they would apply it at a blanket level across all technologies. But now what we see is that as far as cloud is concerned, they treat it very differently, and they treat it differently even at a business unit level. So what that means is there will be few functions who they will try and separate from the unit economics and the pressures of the street so that they can go on their autonomous journey or... Um, not be subject to pressures from the board because they want to further the innovation as well. Whilst at the same time, they would have other run-of-the-mill functions 
which they would apply a cost base to achieve, but not the overall cost to achieve margins. But a lot of that will be based on, at a, based on what use case they are trying to achieve, and also how long the project is going to go on for. So if you look at back in the days of hardware, a classical strategy was, I'll buy a hardware five years, and I'll depreciate it. So over the end of five years, it'll be cost neutral to me on the books. With cloud, that's not happening in that respect. A lot of people believe that cloud is a managed service, but it's really not. And in that respect, there are multiple other additional costs that you have to consider. So procurement teams are changing in that respect, which means how they engage with us as partners and with us as technology company, we also need to evolve. <coughs> so if, if that is the premise of what I was trying to say, this is the one slide which is very important to understand because that's what we as Cloudera believe a lot of companies across domains, across industries will go through. So the first one is that you've got three options, right? Every customer could be on-premise, IS, or PaaS. You can't have all your applications on-premise because that's not aligned with your strategic goals and it will become more costly eventually. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to go on to IS, lift and shift for all apps because not all apps are cloud ready in that respect. And at the same time, you don't want to go to pass because if there isn't a use case whereby you know the nature of the workload will be ephemeral, there's no point. And there are data security governance issues across all providers. So what do you actually do? So what we as Cloudera uh, suggest is, this is kind of a framework which you can employ to have a complete hybrid strategy going forward. So there will be use cases. The way to read that slide is that you have a unified layer. Uh, by the way, some of the names um, like HDF is Hortonworks Dataflow, now it's called as Cladera Dataflow. So it's the previous, it's the slide from the last time's presentation. Um, but you have a unified layer for ingestion of data. And once you have that, you apply a single view of governance and metadata governance across all of your data consumption that you're doing for all the apps that you have. And then you get into something what we believe is a workload optimization matrix. So what does that mean? There will be certain apps which you will always have on premise. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have been working in the IT industry for 20 years or more. And we've never gotten rid of Teradata or Exadata or any of the databases that we've had because some of the apps will always stay. So the most mission critical, high security apps that you have that you absolutely cannot take onto the cloud immediately because you want business continuity or the regulators will ask you for multiple questions and you do not want that disruption, you keep them on premise. The apps which are medium risk and you want the security and governance features on premise, just lift and shift. That's the easiest way. You will drive your cloud strategy in the fastest way by putting those apps onto IS. And for the apps which you don't know exactly what that is, which is the net new apps, and you're not aware of what the nature of the workload will be, how should I go about that? Sure, those are the apps which you should be going onto cloud for. So back in Hortonworks, we didn't have a pass solution in that respect. So we would always say that you can partner with whoever you want. In the new Cloudera world, um, we're starting to develop our proposition in a much more robust way through Altus. And that is one of the key areas that I would recommend a lot of you to work with our product teams and engineering teams to under understand further. But the summary of this slide is that if you have a strategy like this, our SE teams or solution engineering teams, based on their experience across industries and multiple geographies, they can build you that workload-driven deployment matrix. We did that for three banks and, all, and, and one insurance company, and all of them had different cloud providers in that respect. But the beauty of it is you have a lot of savings. So I'm going to talk to you about <coughs> the benefits for hybrid strategy. <coughs> Sorry. So the first one is cost reduction. So 19 to 37%. How do we get up to that? As I said, there are three types of cost reduction benefits that you have. One is workload. So which kind of workloads do I, move on, do I want to move on to the cloud? Generally, if you look at the cloud pricing that all public cl cloud providers have, there are small elements which can have a massive impact. 
and one of them is egress. So if I have to run a reporting, a simple BI analytics use case, and if I have to move my data from Hong Kong to the US and Europe, the cost of egress is massive. So one of the key levers that we pull is that, can you minimize that egress? Second is the cost to put stuff in the cloud is easy, but the cost to take it out is expensive. So can you actually create a mechanism whereby you have a process of what data goes in and can you actually tag the data sets which are going in so that when you have to run a query, it doesn't blow up? Because there are providers, I won't name names, who charge you by terabyte and by number of queries. So they're kind of forcing you to re-architect the whole thing. Because if I run a query and that takes multiple data sources when it's pulling in, the amount of data it'll pull through for every query will be through the roof. So the only way I've got is that I have to re-architect my initial streams of work that I've done. And that's a key element. So you can avoid a lot of those things before. Then there's the whole infrastructure cost, which we as Cloudera don't control. So we don't say that we will help you with that. But that's a saving that you will see. That's not included in this 19 to 37%. And then the third one is the compute cost. So we had a very large <coughs> oil and gas uh, customer. They went onto the cloud. They spent over $110 million going and running that for seven months. And after that, they realized that that's not the right strategy. And they started to offload parts and bits of them back onto on-premise. A large part of that was their compute cost was not optimized to the usage patterns that they had. And again, if you look at the use case in that respect, one of the use cases they had was they wanted 24-7 monitoring of all their commodities which they were trading through. And this was not preventative maintenance of oil rigs, etc. just was purely monitoring of the commodities and the assets that they had. And you don't really need to run that use case on cloud all the times. Because you have a process set up, you will incur multiple um, data requests from multiple teams to be able to produce the reports, and you might end up running the same thing again multiple times in a day. So you have to be careful in terms of what kind of use cases do you deploy the filters around. The second one is service improvement. So what I mean by service improvement over here is FT rationalization or reskilling of costs, which I talked about. So this example is there is a customer for us. They were able to repurpose teams of 14, three teams of 14 people who were basically doing data engineering and uh, cleaning of data kind of work into data science. And that saved them a lot of money. Now, service improvement also means that I'm able to service my lines of businesses in a much faster way. So the whole idea was that if it was taking me before eight to nine months to, de to deliver on a particular use case or to deliver on a particular business SLA, can I accelerate that and can we quantify that? The third one is the cost avoidance. Primarily, this is coming from the cost that you would avoid in terms of what I talked about, cloud portability. So the cost to port an app, again, I would say is two to three million dollars. It depends which geography, which region, but that's the bulk of it in that respect. But the last one is the most important one. So as our customers have been going on this data transformation journey, the role of IT teams has started to become even more important as far as risk is concerned. So we as Cloudera, we don't help customers with capital risk or liquidity risk or insurance risk or any other different types of risk. The only thing that we help with is operational risk and that's what it involves. So you will see if you, if you pull up the uh, annual reports and if you go to the appendix, there are multiple companies who are putting that down and they're saying that the operational risk is being calculated as a function of what their IT project delays will be because that is fundamental to the revenue stream, that is fundamental to your top line, which wasn't the case before. So we spoke to a lot of customers and we did the math and we realized that the cost of risk, which if increases by even 10 bips, can be tens of millions of dollars, you can actually affect that if you have the right cloud strategy. So I'll give an example. So for those of you who saw the IPO filing for Lyft, $26 billion, 
you must have read that they're supposed they will be paying 12 million dollars a month to Amazon so 400 million dollars over the next four years and that's a massive amount in that respect and that is a c-suite agenda item for the CEO and the CFO in that respect naturally there will be a big question around if I'm making such a huge investment what does it mean to my overall risk portfolio and therefore the role of IT in reducing risk is increasing the other example I'll give is there's a very large utility provider who we are talking to. They're building smart grids. And when they went uh, with, with their new program of work and they announced to the market, the key thing that they said is, we want our IT to reduce the risk of any incident. That could be fraud, that could be a cost element, or that could even be an infrastructure issue so that our end customers don't have to suffer on that respect. So risk is a key element, which a lot of customers are telling us that you should consider. And if you combine all of these four elements, so what do you do with it? So what you do with it is you build a business case. So before you want to start on your cloud journey, the most important thing is, can you build a business case at a use case level, at a domain le level? I cannot emphasize this anymore, but this is by far the biggest transformational change that we have seen across multiple industries. So this is an interesting slide. So what does this slide tell us? It's a comparison between leaders and laggards. So who's a leader, who's a laggard? So everyone who have more than 30% of their workloads in production in cloud are a leader. Everyone who has less than 5% of their workloads in production is the key word, in cloud, is a laggard. So if you look at various buckets that we have, there's a massive difference between leaders and laggards. So what this is telling us is that there, to get from a laggard to a leader stage, it will take time. And you have to be patient during that time. But once you cross the critical mass, that's when the benefits start to multiply. That's when you have exponential benefits. So I'll give the public sector example. So we have a very large intelligence agency we work with, and they told us that that incident, the reducing the IT incidents, they were able to reduce after they cross 37% of workloads in production. Why? Because before that, they would spend a lot of times working between their on-premise and cloud infrastructures, and they would have to rewrite multiple algorithms that they had and majority of their operational efficiency was going on in managing the whole process and not actually doing the data science by itself. The other example is the IT overhead cost. So there is a very large logistics provider. They saved over $155 million in one use case, not by going to the cloud, but just by employing big data strategy. So we asked them that, do you have a hybrid strategy? And they said, yes. And we said, how can we as, how can we as Cloudera help you? And they said, the fundamental question that we're struggling with is that from an overall IT overhead perspective, how do we organize the teams? So we said, does that mean center of excellence? And they said, yes. So I talked about this yesterday for those of you in the cab session, that center of excellence has two primary work streams. One, how do I organize the teams itself, which means how many data scientists, how many data analysts, do they need to liaise with the business directly? Should there be a business liaison? Where does the business analytics team come into the picture? What do we do in terms of ensuring constant feedback mechanisms across multiple functions? But there's another element. That element we don't control as Cloudera. That's what a typical, a typical SI or a consulting firm would do. We would partner with them and we would give them our point of view, but we don't do that in that respect. But the, there's non, another element which is the technology processes and policies to support the new organization, to support the new center of excellence. So what are the data pipelines? What are the policies that you need to ensure? Do you have data attributes against each one of them? So if you take all of those in considerations, there are three fundamental center of excellence structures that we are seeing. One is the classic federated structure. Some of them will have NASN structures as well, 
So what does that mean is that you have a CDO function which is separate from the CIO function. They both have their different budgets. They both have different teams. They both liaise with the lines of businesses. And then they have communication between them. But the most successful ones which we are seeing, which actually helps with 30% cost reduction, is the hybrid structure. So what the hybrid structure means is you have a CIO and the CDO reports onto the CIO. Having said that, the CDO has full autonomy to run projects which will be outside of the budgets for costing and accounting. So a classic example is UPS or Unilever. If you look at, if, if you look at how they are structured, that's what they're doing. But at the same time, the CDO function has the ability to leverage the people from the CIO function so that you don't have to go and rehire and your cost base doesn't increase. So at an organizational level, that sounds easy to do. But when you have multiple workflows from a technology perspective, there are multiple things that need to be done around that. And that's where we as Clara believe that we can help with our expertise around that. But it's an interesting point, which is it depends how quickly can you go on to become a leader. And that depends upon your maturity. And maturity is measured by multiple aspects. Again, I talked about at CAP yesterday that we have a customer maturity model, which measures the maturity or current state and aspirational stages of customers. And we help customers understand how the industry is going against that. So that is life. If you want to have a look at it, please feel free to do that. So to end it, I'll just summarize the three technical levers and the three business levers that every customer should be pulling. Again, DevOps and security. I will repeat it again. If you can't do DevOps and automation on premise, you shouldn't go into the cloud. Data portability and mobility uh, and security and movement. Those elements, people combine and they believe that they are the same thing. But if you speak to our solution engineering teams, by the way, I'm not a technical guy. My background is a strategy consultant. I was with BCG. t Bolt, who's there in the back, he was also BCG. Our entire teams are made up of McKinsey and BCG people. Um, so I focus more on the business aspects. But there is a full solution engineering team and professional services team that we have who can help you with the nuances around this. But the key point that I wanted to make is these three pointers, the last two, we had to separate because two of our customers told us that they have been successful because they have separate teams for data um, mobility and portability, which I talked about the impact and cost, and the security element. A lot of teams combine the security teams with the portability aspect, and it's okay if you're on on-premise. But if you're going onto the cloud, as I said, if the impact is $50 million or above, you want to have that differentiation in terms of the RACI matrices that you have, the accountability streams that you would want to have. And the last one is um, for businesses. Use case driven cost model or business case I talked about. Cloud operating model is interesting. Um, more so now that you have more public vendors out there. A lot of people are going for private cloud, specifically public sectors as well in that respect. It does not matter whether your cloud is on private or public in terms of the cost or in terms of how you structure your organization. But it does matter in terms of how you're going to organize the business functions around that to leverage the benefits from that particular operating model. Most companies would sit down with their procurement teams and give them a mandate based on the operating model that they will take. Most SIs would come in and say that, oh, we'll build a new target operating model for you, and this is what the best model is. In our experience, we haven't seen any particular model which is more uh, suited for the cloud or than anything else, is the usual aspects that we have for any other technology. But the key point that we have noticed is that if you have to accelerate your journey to the cloud, and that's what we as Cloudera tell, that we will help you accelerate your journey to the cloud, the key thing to consider is, have you done the business case and the operating model, again, at a use case level, at a very starting level? And skills and resources is the last element, and I'll, give, I'll end with an example. We did a survey in the US, this is not for the European customers, and we realized that once you have the A star or your t rock stars in the various teams, it takes on an average six and a half to seven months to ramp them up. And then they would perform for the next four months and then they would leave. 
So between 11 months and 18 months is the critical time frame when a lot of these rock stars start to either think about whether they should go on to another teams internally or they should just leave the organization. So this company, they're very advanced and they have an app whereby they measure all the interactions from the customers and their people internally. So every time I give a talk, every time I engage in a meeting, every time I um, present to a customer or whatever, everyone around me can give me a feedback. So Zalando in the UK does the same thing, but they are slightly more advanced, the company I'm talking about, because um, they take the 360 feedback and they build a model in terms of their talent retention strategy, not only talent acquisition strategy. And it has actually helped them retain a lot of their technical resources who are rock stars, and they've seen a massive difference in that respect. And it's very important because I'm pretty sure all of you guys might feel that in the new world where technology is becoming even more important, if you have to have rock stars from a data strategy perspective or cloud capability perspective, there is a, a skill war out there in that respect, and you do want to retain your talent in that respect. This is a comparison of the cloud option. I will not go into the detail, but for those of you who've attended DataWorks Summit before, there was somebody gave me feedback and said, can you talk about what's alters how can you go on to IS and how can you go on to PASS? I'm very happy to share the slides after this, so I'll let you go on. The last point which I would like to end is, a lot of the times our customers ask us that, you as Cloudera, is there any particular example that you've seen whereby customers can go onto the cloud in less than two years? I have been to over 147 customers myself, I haven't. And I wanted to address that because Everyone asks me that question in terms of timelines. The fastest I have seen is um, organization who had less than 300 nodes to put things into perspective in production, and they went on to full cloud, a mixture of IS and PaaS, in uh, 19 months. But that's a very small deployment. For most companies who have more than 500 nodes, they have a deferred plan based on what their investment strategy is. And I don't know how much time I have, but I'm very happy to take questions. So uh, the question is that the previous slide, which I said, um, you should separate your data portability and data security to expand on that, right? So before we, we observed <coughs> that a lot of customers had the data security teams combined with the data portability teams. Because data portability wasn't really a subject unless you were going onto the cloud in that respect. And even if you were, a lot of people wouldn't take cognizance of that because they didn't know what the impact of that was. So speaking to multiple customers, we suggested that, that why don't you make it a different team who would specifically focus on which apps should I port when should I port? What, should, what will be the cost? Because as I said, there's a cost of porting, but also business continuity. What will be the impact on various workflows that exist? What will the impact on various lines of businesses going forward? And if you think of it, it's a full-time job in that by itself. So a lot of people who had multiple apps on premise, and if you want to go into the cloud, you should separate that function from data security is what I meant. If you're net new, if you're a startup, or if you're starting a new function, and majority of the use cases are all about time to market, then you, should, you probably don't need that because you're going onto the cloud from day zero any which was in that respect. That's what I mean. Any, other, any last questions? Perfect, thanks a lot guys for coming over. I'm around here, so if you have any questions, more than happy to answer.